Hi, when it comes to audio interfaces, there are many brands and types of course, but I've been using RME audio interfaces for years now. They basically do what they need to do without any fuss. They have rock solid drivers, sound very transparent, and their software support for their older products basically lasts, well, for forever, I think. I remember getting my first RME audio interface as part of a deal with the TC PowerCore card. Remember that one? The PowerCore card has long been discontinued, but that audio interface card that I got with that from RME is still supported. There's one thing, however, that many get confused about when it comes to RME, and that's their software called Total Mix, which you can use to set up special routings in your RME audio interface, but it is so powerful that it can be quite overwhelming. There's no need to be overwhelmed though, because as with any piece of software, for example, Microsoft Word, Excel, or even our own beloved Cubase, but you can do pretty much anything you need by only using 10% or less of the application. So in this video, we'll take a look at the basics of Total Mix, which should be sufficient for 99% of you. So let's go. So what I'm currently running in my PC over here is an RME HDSP AES card, which allows me to connect over AES, which is a digital type of connection, to AD and DA converters. And what I'm running as an AD DA converter is the ADI 8DS Mark III. Quite a whole mouthful, but it's basically an 8-channel AD and DA converter. So it provides me with 8 analog inputs and 8 analog outputs without preamps. But RME provides a lot of audio interfaces, of course, starting, for example, from the Babyface Pro to the very popular range of UFX converters connected via USB and also containing some preamps. But no matter what kind of RME interface you're using, the software that they provide is Total Mix, and that basically works the same on any of their interfaces. Now, I have eight channels back in the rack over here, not so much because I'm often recording eight channels in parallel, but it's more that I also have some outboard equipment like EQs and compressors that I use during mixing as insert effects. And then you need additional inputs and outputs, which you can use at the same time. Now, when it comes to Total Mix, initially when I started using RME interfaces, I didn't even use it because out of the box, the default routing is set up in such a way that you can immediately use it from your door and you don't really need to use the Total Mix software. You only need to use the Total Mix software when you set up some special routing in your interface or you want to use some of the effects that are provided in some of the RME interfaces. So let's have a look at Total Mix. So this is a Total Mix software, and you can see that it's really divided into four areas, hardware inputs, software playback, hardware outputs, and some additional controls here on the right side. Now this software is also very configurable. I've set it up in such a way that you get easy access to what you really need. And this is usually the default setup in which it starts. But let's just go over those settings so you can set up your total mix in the same way so you can follow along. First thing is that the function over here, I've set it up in mixer view. As you can tell, there's a mixer displayed. There's also the matrix view, which allows you to connect inputs and outputs in different ways. But let's stick with the mixer view for this basics tutorial. Now in options, operational mode, I have it set up for full mode, mixer active, all routing options available. So we can do some special routings in this mode. The other mode is simplified, but we're not going to choose that one. We'll stick with full mode. As far as routing mode over here goes, I've set it to submix, meaning that you can make submixes for your hardware outputs here. More about that later. Yeah, and I have a special option set here, always on top, because if I then go to Cubase, you can see that total mix stays in front of Cubase, which is nice for this tutorial. Now let's look at the three sections in the mixer. On top, you can see that I have my hardware inputs and they literally show what's coming in on the inputs of my audio interface. Now over here, you can see that I have 16 channels, but since I only have an eight channel AD converter connected, I'm only using the first eight. However, there is some use for the rest of them as well, even though there's no AD converter connected and I'll show you that later on. Going back to the inputs, you can see over here that the meters basically show what's coming in on the inputs. And on the first channel, you can see that's the input of my voice because you see it moving when I talk. Now there's the usual mute and solo buttons. The fader is down. It doesn't need to be up to actually use the signal on the input. Again, I'm going to show you later what the fader is all about. But another interesting option on the inputs is that you can see one, two, three, four, five, six are set up as stereo channels, but that's configurable because seven and eight over here are set up as mono channels. But I could, by clicking on this little wrench here, set it to stereo, and then you can see that seven and eight are combined, and I can set it back to mono again, after which the panning is still a stereo configuration, so you can change that by control clicking on the pan, and now the pan position is zeroed out again. So whatever I connect to the eight inputs on my AD converter will show up on these eight inputs over here. 
Now next up is the software playback section. Again, they are configured as eight stereo channels at the moment. However, I only have eight mono channels on my DA converter. So I'm only using the first eight. You can again set this to mono inputs if you want. And whenever I play back something in software on my PC, it will end up in one of these channels, depending on which output I have assigned in my software. For example, let's have a look. If I start playback on this audio track here, you can see that it ends up over here on stereo one and two. And that's the case because if I go to Cubase Studio Audio Connections, and I'm using the control room in Cubase, so I need to go to the control room. My main monitors are on outputs one and two of the audio interface. And that's the reason why when I start playback, it will show up here on the one and two playback channels in total mix. However, if I set here, for example, that I want to send this to nine and 10 of my audio interface, and I play back now, you can see that the output of Cubase appears on nine and 10. Even though I don't really have a DA converter connected to those channels, I can route audio to it, as you can see. Let's set this back to the regular one and two outputs because we still have one layer left, which is the hardware outputs. Let's select the main hardware outputs, which are really one and two, which you can see over here, by the way, the main outputs are assigned to one and two. But this is also where it gets confusing for a lot of people because on this layer, you determine what is actually sent to the physical outputs of my DA converter over there. So even though in Cubase, I have configured to go to output one and two, as you just saw in the playback layer, in the hardware outputs layer, I can decide that outputs one and two that I'm routing to in the software will appear on an entirely different hardware output if I wanted to. Now, how do you see what is routed to the actual physical outputs? Well, you do that by selecting one of the faders here in the hardware output section. And then on top, you can see what the mix is, which is going to that output. So for example, my main one and two outputs, when I connect cables to one and two, what's coming out of it? You can see that only this fader is open. So basically whatever my software sends to one and two will also appear on hardware output one and two. And that's actually the default way all those hardware outputs have been set up. You would expect that, of course. For example, what is sent to hardware outputs three and four? Well, whatever I'm sending to three and four via the software. Five, six, whatever I'm sending to five, six in the software. Seven, eight, whatever I'm sending to seven, eight on the software, etc. But you can literally also route something else to an output. For example, if we go to hardware outputs 11 and 12, Again, they're not physically present those outputs because I only have eight channels, but I can still use it in the software. And for example, I could say, well, on hardware output 11, 12, I don't actually want what is being sent by the software to 11, 12, but I just want a duplicate of what the software is already sending to one and two. And if I also have connected something to my inputs, I can also say, for example, input eight, I also want input eight to be routed to hardware output 11 and 12. So if you would now listen to 11 and 12, it would be a mix of what is being sent to software playback channels one and two by your software, as well as what's coming in on input eight. So this is very flexible. In a minute, I will discuss why you would ever want to do that. What are the practical use cases? But I first want to talk about one other thing, and that's that little orange wrench here, which you can see, because something special has been configured on hardware output five and six over here. So if I open that wrench, you can see that loopback has been enabled. And that's a special feature in Total Mix, which now causes whatever is available at hardware outputs five and six on my interface will also be directly routed back to the inputs five and six on the interface, which is very useful. For example, if you want to record what you are outputting to hardware output five and six, you don't have to connect the cable from the interface output five and six to one of your inputs again, because you can do that in software. Now, one more thing for the basic functionality is that when you have set up some kind of routing here in Total Mix, you can store it and save it as a snapshot. For example, I can push store to save the current setup of Total Mix, and I can decide to do that in this Mix 8 slot, which I'm currently not using. I can then double click, and let's say that I want to call this tutorial setup which you can then always recall. But I shouldn't really do that because I'm currently recording on OBS. So let's switch back to my OBS recording setup. But you can save eight snapshots of Total Mix for further use. And you can see that I've done that, for example, for my regular recording when I'm recording music, for OBS recording, which I'm using now to record these videos. I also have a special setup when I'm recording my camper for playing guitar. And I have a special setup for when I'm streaming via OBS. 
which are all snapshots that I've stored in Total Mix for easy recall. Now, before I go on to the practical use of all of this, if you like this video or find it useful at all, please give it a big thumbs up for the YouTube algorithm so that it gets shown to more people. Subscribe to the channel and ring the little bell icon if you want to get notified when I publish another video. For even more support, consider using the super thanks button below the video, which is a virtual tip jar. Or you can also buy anything via the affiliate links in the description of this video. I have affiliate links to individual products, but I also have store-wide affiliate links. And if you click any of the affiliate links to a certain store, if you then buy something at that store, I will get a small commission without any additional cost to you, which helps the channel very much and which is very much appreciated. But let's have a look at some of the practical use cases of all this wizardry with Total Mix. Now, one of the practical use cases for all this routing power is, for example, if you're recording a singer and you want latency-free monitoring of that singer. Because if your vocalist is singing and you're routing it through Cubase and out to her headphones, for example, there will be latency depending on whatever is happening in your project, depending on how many effects you already have applied to it. There will be more and more latency and that can be quite distracting for a singer or any instrumentalist for that matter. So there's a very easy way in Total Mix to set that up. Again, let's imagine that I want my singer to sing to this backing track, which I have over here. So if I play back, you can see that the backing track is appearing at the main hardware outputs. So that's whatever she's hearing. But if I now also wanted to hear my own voice on the main output together with the backing track, I can just open up this input channel here to also be routed to main output. So on the main output, you can now listen to whatever is being sent to output one and two by my software and what's coming in on input one with virtually no latency. I think that's like a couple of milliseconds seconds but it's definitely not noticeable and your singer will be able to listen to her own voice directly now obviously there are no effects on this vocal now because even if you apply the facts in cubase you're basically taking the signal before it goes to cubase and directly routing it to your main outputs but some of the RME audio interfaces do have effects on board. So in that case, you can, for example, put some comfort reverb on her vocal so that she doesn't have to listen to it totally dry. Now, another use case is when you're making a special cue mix for your musicians. Let's have a look at that. Because let's now imagine that I have two musicians that want to play live to this backing track over here, but they both want to have a personalized headphone mix, hearing their own instrument a bit louder than the other one. So what you can then do in this case, you can, for example, use channels 9, 10 and 10, 11 for their headphone mix. On the first headphone mix, you just want to hear the backing track, which is coming in on software playback one and two. And let's imagine that both instruments are connected to stereo channels. This is player one on channel nine and 10, and this is player two on channel 11 and 12. And this player just wants to hear his own instrument a bit louder. So let's take down the other player a bit. And the headphone mix of the other player could, for example, be, well, very similar. I want the main playback, both players, but you can take down this player a little bit. And now you have two separate headphone mixes on these hardware outputs, and each player will get his own mix of what he needs to hear. Now, another possibility is that you want to record something which is being played back on your PC via another application, maybe. For example, let's say that I want to record into Cubase whatever I'm playing back on Spotify or some other application, but I'm just using Spotify as an example. So let's open Spotify and let's play back, well, a track of my own band, for example. You can see that the audio of this track is routed to outputs one and two in software. And that's actually determined by the sound settings in Windows. You can see that in the sound settings I've set up that the main sound output is output one and two of my AES interface. So that's why Spotify is outputting to playback one and two. And that's going directly to my main outputs one and two, which are physically the one and two channels on the interface. However, what I can now also do, and I will again use 9 and 10, which are outputs that I do not actually have on my interface, but I can still use them in this mixer. For example, I can say that on outputs 9 and 10, I don't want whatever's being sent to 9 and 10, but I want whatever's being sent to 1 and 2. So you can see that outputs 1 and 10 now contain a copy of whatever Spotify is playing back. And if I now enable over here loopback what's happening is that this same signal is coming back into inputs 9 and 10. now you cannot actually see that in the mixer over here but if i go to cubase my audio connections and i add an input on channels 9 and 10 for example let's call it spotify for now and i say that i want to use inputs 9 and 10 and if i open the cubase mixer you can see that I have the audio now also coming in on inputs 9 and 10, being the Spotify input to Cubase. So if I now add a track here and call it Spotify, 
and I take the input from Spotify, 9 and 10 inputs. I can just enable recording, start recording, and I'm actually recording what is currently being played on Spotify. And that's all without having to connect loopback cables to your interface and occurring an extra ADDA conversion step, because you can do it right in Total Mix at the digital level. So as you can see, Total Mix is a very powerful application, but it's really also quite simple if you just know these basics, which is probably sufficient for 99% of you. And it's definitely sufficient for how I've used Total Mix in all these years. Now, if you want to see how I use my RME interface with Total Mix and the Cubase control room to record the audio for these videos, so both my voice as well as the playback from Cubase, as well as the playback from any desktop application, I have a separate video about that, which I'll link over here. Check it out, enjoy, and see you soon.